and CEO of a small medical informatics company called the Roman Project, Roman for Remote Online Monitoring Network, and also because as a three-decade member of the Society for Creative Anachronism, I happen to like armor and everything medieval and ancient. Um, I asked Cliff uh, if we could co-author this paper and presentation because I wanted to express to the TCL community our appreciation for what programming language and Cliff has been able to accomplish. We created a product called Lorisus, which is a takeoff on the Roman name for a suit of armor. And over the next uh, half hour, I guess you and I are going to discuss, I'm going to mention what it is I wanted made and how I arrived to Cliff's telephone at his home and the process by which we became buddies through TCL. And then I'm going to let him explain the nuts and bolts of how it actually happened. But I heard somebody last night say, does this mean that TCL is becoming a, a, what, a rejuvenation? This is a rejuvenation or revitalization of uh, uh, TCL. My presentation is to tell you that TCL has very real commercial applications that have never been dreamt of before. Okay, next slide. Now, this is a bottle of medication that I bought last month, and I probably paid $50 for it between insurance, and copay, and all that. And when I look at this, I don't think of the $50. I think of the fact that it took the pharmaceutical company somewhere between $300 million to $1.5 billion to bring this drug to market in the United States alone. It's a very, very expensive proposition to bring new products to market. Now, I was critically injured uh, almost four years ago, and I have 15 inches of a titanium device in my leg to save my right leg that two years before my injury was not on the market. Uh, so I have kind of a vested interest in what's happening medically, but I've also been in the medical field since the age of 19 when I joined the Navy as a hospital corpsman. Uh, on, I became a physician assistant, uh, I was a lab tech before that, and nuclear submarines, and then when I retired I went to work uh, on a grant from the NIH working with AIDS uh, out in California, and then on into cancer. So my entire life has been wrapped around medical research and medical advances of some kind. When I was a young lab tech, I watched uh, leukemic children at the Oakland Navy Hospital where 85% of them died. Now, here we are, four decades later, 85% of them are cured. So, it's a huge change. Uh, we've basically flipped the statistics with leukemia. Ten years ago, Diabetes was a marginally controlled disease with a high mortality rate. Today, it is a life controllable disease through medications where we're greatly extending the health and the lifespan of people with diabetes. And that can go on heart disease, you name it, oncology, you name it, just about anything. So, medical research is a passion of mine. And I'm very glad to be involved with it, but it's, it's expensive. Next slide, please. Every drug, every medical device, every MRI machine, every diagnostic test that is used in this country on a prescription has to be approved by the Food and Drug Administration. And the same thing is true in other countries. The EMEA in Europe, uh, UK Medical Authority, the Canadian Health Authority, you name it. Every country has the FDA equivalent, and they must approve drugs and devices and, de and therapeutics before they can be given to patients. So how do you get there? You get there through what's called studies or clinical trials. And those clinical trials are very important. Now, every clinical trial requires accurate, detailed source documentation. That is, if a nurse takes a blood pressure where they first record that, is the source document. If an ECG report is printed out, that source document is the printout. If a doctor writes a note in a computer, electronic medical record, that is the source document. And those are what we use for verifying and validating the data that is reported from the doctors and hospitals and clinics that do these studies. Next, please. So there's a wide range of source documents that must be looked at. And 
there are very rigid rules uh, accepted, or actually here in the U.S. and accepted worldwide, called good clinical practice and good documentation practice, that if you don't follow them, your data will be rejected. Next, please. Now, every reported, uh, every study that's reported, the sponsors, that's the pharmaceutical companies, medical device companies, whatever, universities that are paying for the study and running it, they have to provide evidence that effective monitoring was done. And monitoring is going out and doing like a mini audit at every site where the study was conducted and saying, yes, they followed the protocol, yes, they have a regulatory approval, and yes, there's accurate, there's documentation of all the data that they reported. If they don't, you've got to throw that data out and start over. Now, it's the traditional model that's been going on for as long as I've been in the clinical trials industry, which is more than a quarter of a century, is that a study is done, uh, somebody like myself goes out to the study sites, the hospitals, looks at the patient charts, looks at the laboratory reports, the ECG printouts, the surgical reports, whatever, and then says, yes, the state is accurate, or there's a mistake here, please fix it. That's called the traditional monitoring approach. Next. Problem is, it's expensive. I imagine the majority of the people in this room flew here or drove here. It's an expensive proposition. Now try doing it uh, on business travel, where you fly out on Monday and maybe back on Wednesday. All of a sudden, your trip is a Tickets have quadrupled over flying back on Saturday. <coughs> Hotels are expensive. The person's time is expensive. Because when I'm sitting in an airplane for some company, it's pretty much non-productive time. This is a very expensive process. But this is what has been done. This is called the traditional monitoring model. And people did not have a way of, of changing it. So I looked at it and said, if 25 to 30% of every study budget is eaten up by monitoring, and at least half of that is related to travel, then the solution is to reduce the amount of travel. Well, how can we do that? Next slide, please. Um, there had to be a change. But at the same time, at the end of the day, the company, the sponsors, uh, my clients, had to be able to look the FDA in the eye and said this study was adequately monitored. And how do you do that? Well, I, I was at a conference, uh, I was still in a wheelchair after my injuries, and I was at a conference, and I kept hearing this from the FDA and other present, presenters, and I went back to my room, and on a yellow legal pad, I wrote out the framework for how we could do this. And it was to create a central repository of copied, certified, and de-identified redacted records from study sites so that they could be remotely available for review of the reported data. And most of the data these days is being reported in uh, what, digital uh, case books. In other words, they log in, they enter the, the results into a computer database and uh, certify it, and, and somebody like me comes along and still goes to the site and looks at the records to verify what they've uploaded. Or they can be paper. Next, please. So the FDA has been pushing for what's called risk-based monitoring for several years. And that's where sponsors focus their efforts on sites that are known to have problems or on sites, meaning uh, doctors and clinics, that have not yet proven themselves for being good, uh, good investigators. But you still, if you, if you think a site is good and you haven't checked, and it turns out the FDA looks and they're not good, you've just blown your study and increase the cost of, of developing your problem. Next slide, please. Okay. So, central repository of medical records. Oops. There's HIPAA and now HITECH in the US. There's the EU Data Protection Directive and now the new Article 29 assessment on that. Um, every country now has their own privacy regulations many of which are based on the EU framework. There's even uh, state privacy laws like Massachusetts and California that are tighter than the federal laws. So no doctor in their right mind is going to let you make photocopies of the patient's charts, 
tack them up online on a web portal and walk away. Uh, they can't afford it, the, the fines are going to be huge, and their uh, reputation will be destroyed. So you have to find a way to protect it. Next slide. Uh, go ahead, next slide, please. So it has, my solution had to fulfill all these criteria. Uh, let me get back to you so you got folks can see. I have no balance, by the way. It's one of the things I lost in my injury. So. Um, if you think I'm walking like a drunk, it's just because I have no balance. Trust me, I haven't been to the bar today. Okay, so it has to comply with all this, including ease of use. To produce the uploaded records, many of the people who are going to be doing this, they're not IT professionals. Many of them are medical clerks, people with a high school education, sometimes less. But they have to be able to use a piece of software that's easier than using, let's say, Word. So, and yet at the same time, it has to fulfill all of these strict regulations for privacy, <coughs> protection, uh, protection of protected health information, preventing from hackers getting into it. So, the more and more I got into this, the more and more complex it, it started to become. Next slide, please. Uh, and yeah, and while you go on the next slide, whatever I did had to produce more savings than the cost of getting the product from. Okay, so the first step. In uh, September of uh, 2011, I went to New Zealand and met with a uh, very talented and very energetic uh, company that actually developed their own programming language. And you can tell from the tie, I am not a programmer. <laughs> and um, I know very little about programming, uh, other than the fact that like statistics, it gives me highs. And, but they said their, their language is totally unique. Uh, that's why their security was so high. When I, they developed a proof of concept for me that showed the basic need that I had of uh, reaching into an encrypted database, extracting information, and using it to redact, to de-identify a mock patient record could be done. But as I got into it, the timeline for development grew. The cost grew almost exponentially, the projected cost. And it became very apparent to me and to this company that many of the steps I wanted integrated into one smooth process would have to be handled in multi-steps. For example, open the document with this, and then it passes it off to a file, which you then open with another program, and finally another to transmit it. You couldn't do that. This has to be a simple process, remember, for somebody with a high school education to do, and do it very quickly. So then I went to, I found another programmer who was using Clarion, which appeared to be uh, the answer to many of my problems, because Clarion, again, this is second hand, uses packets of information that you can cobble together to very quickly create a, uh, a larger program without having to code in every piece of information. And many of these packages are available, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, open, open source, uh, the ones that are commercially available are not very expensive. And over, I guess, about the next uh, six months, he developed a very rough version of my product. But then we ran into limitations. There's a lot of things that Clarion cannot do. And that includes easily handle such things as .NET, and some of the Windows libraries, and some of this, and some of that. and it became apparent that it was going to take a very long time and a lot of effort and licensing in a lot of products that I couldn't afford to get roughly where I wanted to be. So, next. So I, I wanted that this slide be singing uh, John Lennon's The Long Winding Road because that's how I felt at the time. I was told that it would take me two to three years and between two to three million dollars to create this product and bring it to market. That's pretty scary because that's paying for most of this out of my own pocket. So in looking for some solutions, I tracked down SQLite uh, encryption extension. I contacted Dr. Richard Hip and said, is your product usable for this piece I need? And he says, well, yeah, it should be easily usable for that. And I said, who would you recommend to work on this? He says, I've got a name for you. And he said, I highly recommend him, uh, Cliff Flynn. So I contacted Cliff, and uh, next slide, please. 
within a month, actually less than a month, of me contacting Cliff, he showed me a demo, a proof of concept, that was more advanced than what Clarion had ever produced. Uh, we went from our email handshake to a locked commercial product in 11 months. And I lost nothing of my original design along the way. I had this vision as a medical person, a researcher, what I needed to lower the cost of clinical trials, improve their quality, and hopefully make a commercially viable product. Now, you've always heard the saying that time is money. Time is money to business in two ways. Number one, the longer it takes to develop something, the more it's going to cost. Secondly, the real cost is if you don't get to the market before your competition. Five months after Cliff locked down our product Lorisys, we're still the only company in the world offering this product. In fact, we've been called disrupting technology because we're upsetting the apple cart how people have done things for the past 30 years. So I owe, and my company owes Cliff a, a great deal, including, um, <laughs> not maybe nearly enough, um, we developed in under a year, and for less than a tenth of what I was told it would cost, we've created a product that is easy to use, that is secure, <coughs> that uh, protects uh, the uh, privacy of any patient records, that protects the uh, uh, liability status of the hospitals and clinics and ourselves, and is easily configurable so that each site, the disk that we send to each site cannot be used by any other. And it can be updated easily. And it works very, very well. Now that's the non-programmer side. What I want, uh, do I have any other slides? I don't know. Oh, this is Lorisys. This is the product that is installed at the study sites. It takes one minute to install the administrative module and one minute to install the, the user module. Um, literally, it is so simple that anybody can install it. It works very, very well. And I, I say I'm just fantastic. What you see here, the components you see, are only the major steps that Lorisys goes through in creating this up process uploaded document that comes onto our servers in North Carolina. There's many steps behind the scenes, and Cliff has had to integrate, I don't know, probably a dozen different languages, components, libraries, and guess what, it's robust. It doesn't lock up, it doesn't crash. I've run it on Windows uh, XP, through 7, through uh, Windows 8. He runs it on a virtual machine in Linux, we can run it on Windows Terminal Server. And for a lot, I put it on my Mac and ran it in a Parallels environment, and it functions just as fine. Doesn't matter. It doesn't care. Try to do with that with most other programs that are commercially available out there. This is an amazing product, and it was TCL that made it happen. So to answer somebody's question last night, yeah, this is a rejuvenation, a revival of a TCL. You need to go to your clients and say, what we can do with TCL is bring your product to market months or years ahead of your competition. And I will stand up and say that to anyone that wants uh, verification. Cliff, I think the next one is you. Okay. And um, I'm very happy that Bruce is singing my praises, but the truth is, anybody in this room could have done what I did. Um, most of you would have done it faster. Most of you would have done a couple different tools. So, first trick, um, Bruce had a, a lot of ideas. He had a very well thought out design. This was a, a well thought out set of what he needed, which is, uh, as most of us in consulting know, is way different from what our usual client comes to us when they wave their hand and say, I want to get a computer and it's going to do things and it'll be really great. <laughs> so, he knew, um, yeah, I knew he had to run on MS Windows because that's what's out there. Um, but we had to get cross-platform, too, because he wants to go into Europe and Asia, and they're more into other platforms. They, they like things that are free. Um, so 
Yeah. That kind of pushes us in a certain direction that we all recognize. Had to have multiple language support. Had to be able to print things out in Hindi and um, Cyrillic. Um, and well, we know which language has UTF-16 at the bottom. Um, I needed to be able to do secure internet transfers. We had to be able to go through SSH or SSL, something like that, because we couldn't take a chance on anything getting interrupted in the middle. Um, wanted a shrink wrap quality GUI. Um, and he came to me to design it. Yeah. <laughs> this oh, proves no. it really didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know. But you can do it in Tickle. You know, Brian knows that you can do it in Tickle. Um, <coughs> it was tricky. We had a bunch of third-party libraries that were not designed to work with Tickle. They weren't designed to work with anything except the Visual C++ and the Microsoft environment. And um, some of them were custom built by people who refused to listen to requirements. Um, that one was fun. And then we have to do the user validation. That's pretty easy. Um, we all know those kinds of things. So tools that I use, that's just, you know, that's not, sure, not supposed to be the most fun. It is. Okay. Um, just go through some of the stuff that I grabbed. These are all standard tools that we've all got. Um, Twappy. That gave me my access to the Windows, man, Windows system. Um, yeah. You have access to everything that's in the Windows system libraries. And it's a very nice package. It's solid and it works. So you can do something like Twappy shutdown system restart. So um, part of this, we looked at that. We also had to do installation. We had to do some validation. I looked at um, the standard installation tools, and they all said, and then you write your own, your own code in our own macro language to do all of the user validation and all of this other stuff. And I said, why? Um, yeah. It's easier to just write a tickle script to do the installations. And then I control it, it does everything, and if I'm to write everything in a macro language, I'll do it in the macro language I know. Um, so you might be let me do the things like, you know, after you've installed this, you have to restart your system. We can do that. Um, check to make sure that you're running as admin. Yeah. It's just a fairly simple little call, and as you expect, it works. Um, if Acrobat is installed, we want to give the user a chance to review the document before they ship it. But only if Acrobat is installed. So um, DDE lets us talk to Acrobat and send a command so Acrobat can come up, display a document, um, open it up, file native name, um, lets us convert from what I'm using inside of Tickle to what Windows thinks and what Acrobat is going to think things are. Again, part of the installation. Registry has been in Tickle for a long time. Um, anybody that's used RegEdit, RegEdit, you know, Registry is just so nice. And it's pretty simple. Um, the only trick is that Windows wants to see the backslashes, so you've got to double your backslashes. Um, but then you can say, get my key, the DB path, see whether or not they've actually installed the database. If they haven't, then my no DB will be, will be positive, and I can pull up a menu that says, you can't install the workstation code because you don't have a database for it to talk to. Um, talk to your sysadmin, get this taken care of. Okay, multi-language support. Um, well, Toronto conference, I think it was, um, <coughs> the idea that you could do cheap and dirty multi <coughs> support using the, uh, the array that introduced um, in a paper, and then this is rolled into Tickle as the MSG cat library or package. And you would say, I want to set it. Here's my locale string, a key for what I'm going to say, and the string to print. And then someplace later, I'll say that I want to display this string, and it'll come out in the language that has been set for what our current language is. Um, the downside to doing something like this is it makes your code a little bit harder to read. When you're just writing in English or your native language, it's easy to scan through your code and say, yeah, here it is. Here's my entry widget. Um, and say you've got to check and say, it, that was GUI under bar ENT or something like that. Um, but it works. Okay. Um, in order to preserve the, um, the security of this system, the documents are transmitted via SSL but they are also encrypted with a DES encryption before they're transmitted over SSL. So even if you manage to hack one of the less secure transfer media, 
the best you're going to get out of it is something that's been encrypted again. And um, Steve Landers, you know, he wrote that, he gave us an interface into the CryptLib library several years ago. And you know, it was there. It wasn't nailed down. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you. But it, it got us what, you know, grabbed that and then there it was. And of course, we all know SQLite. That was where Bruce started with this, was he needed a database that wasn't going to be living on a server, that was going to be very easily controlled. Um, and one of the things that Richard offers is what he calls the SEE extension, the uh, SQLite encrypted. Um, that one is not a free extension, just for people who are wondering. He charges for that, but it's, you know, being Richard, it's a very generous, it's a cheap license, and you can do whatever you want with it. At that point, you've got a database that is encrypted, um, DES, RC4. Um, your code will have a key in it, or you'll have the user enter a key. But otherwise, it's a, you, know, you do a file on it, and it says data. It is no longer recognizable as an SQLite database. So all of the contents of it, all of your schemas, things like that, all hidden. So those are the things that I pulled out of TCL, just out of our libraries, tickled it, things like that. Um, there are a few other things that made this development a lot faster. Um, the libraries that I had to deal with had nasty I.O., had nasty APIs. The, um, you know, this, this, library, this function takes a pointer to a structure with a union in it, with pointers to whatevers. Um, ordinarily, I would use critical to build an interface to something, but these things were nasty enough that I decided I would let grab Swig and let it play with games for me and give me the interfaces. Um, I did a talk on edit table last year. Um, we actually did end up putting that into the final product, but mostly what it did was it meant um, I could get something <coughs> for a first prototype out faster, and then we could start playing with it and working from there. DKNS I've talked about a few times over the years. Um, there's another tool that I've stolen and expanded. So people who aren't familiar with Swig, what Swig does, it stands for the Software Interface Generator. I think that's what he calls it. Simplified Wrapper, Simplified wrapper Interface Generator, yeah. He should have called it software because that's what I always call it. <laughs> um, you take a .h file, and usually that will not work, but if you massage it down a little bit, it will generate for you all of the C code and, and include files to generate a thickle extension that will go in there. And it will give you a very ugly way to interact with all of the um, structures and things like that that are in there. It's ugly, but it works. Um, and that import-export can be very useful when, you, when you're dealing with those structures with unions and pointers to things. Edit table, talked about last year. What it does is it generates a GUI for data entry based on an SQL schema. So you can just take your database schema and generate a GUI. The original GUI you're going to get from that is um, <coughs> it's the kind of thing you'd expect from me designing a GUI. <laughs> um, okay. Um, but with a little bit of tweaking, um, we get something that actually is laid out well, um, looks like what people want. You get pull downs for where there's choices rather than just entry widgets. Um, and this one actually went into the real product. Um, it's not the original schema out of the database, it's a packed together schema to give. Um, what is actually a compilation of two or three tables merged into one, one display. Because from the user's point of view, it looks like this, even though from the schema point of view, I have things split out differently. Um, the advantage from my point of view is it meant that I had something up and running. One of the nasty parts of the database application is getting that initial data into a database before you have the database application to work with it. So being able to just generate the screens got me going. TK test. Um, TK replay was done by um, oh, Bennett Key, I think it was. Anyhow, introduced way back. Um, I took that code about five or six years ago and brought it back into the current year and expanded it some. And I use it for regression testing. Um, what it does is it will record and replay when you hit widgets. Um, in order to make it multi platform, I have ended up, especially to work with TTK. I've ended up putting in some fake widgets that will not duplicate the appearance of the original widgets, but will give me the functionality. So I'm not testing to see whether or not 
to pull down the widget is working right. I'm testing to see that my application works right when somebody selects this new data. So sometimes it doesn't look as clean as the, as the real document, but it works the same. And it means that I can test it from the, um, from the GUI. When you're getting into the later phases, especially of a project, you get to the bit where it, in order to test the new feature that I've added, I have to select a user, I have to select a name, I have to select a study, I have to type in the database, I have to type in this and that. Um, at 3 a.m. in the morning, if I can go through five steps and not make three mistakes, that's doing pretty good. Um, if I can do it once, the TK test will keep replaying that and I come back and I can keep beating on this piece of new code until I've got that working. Extend TK test another couple of lines and work on the next piece of code. So it reduces your edit test cycle. Um, Part of what we're doing right now, Bruce mentioned that we give custom releases to every customer. They are coded for this site and this study. So um, I use TK, TK test with those like modification, goes in and opens the database of our sites and customers, and I build the basics with a script that just fills in a blank database, puts in the schema, and then TK test goes in, starts off the administrator program, and types in all the fields. So it gives me another piece of um, exercising the, the administration code when I make every release. And of course, before I ship, ship them out, I have another TK test that goes through and says, let me go through my, my, my initial studies, let me go through each document type, let me upload them to the data to our central server, um, and then I check with the guy who runs the central server and say, you know, I just uploaded 16 documents, did you get them all in the right places? And we know that this is ready before we ship it. And yeah, there's like an hour's worth of testing there, but I'm getting, lit, getting lunch while that's going on. Conclusion. Okay, this is no big surprise. You know, it worked. Like I said, anybody in this room would have done the same thing. Or variation. Steve would have used critical instead of using swig. Because um, he understands it better than I do. Um, tickle is stable. We, all, you know, we know that. But this was a real good demonstration. I started out with the V1 tickle. Um, I never found any bugs. We shifted it over to 8.6 all. It just works. Um, TickleLib, I pulled things out of TickleLib. Jeff was commenting a little bit about how it would be nice to have a CPAN where everybody kicks things in. John commented on that. The great thing about TickleLib is that I know Andreas has tested everything I pull out of it. I don't have to go through and say, there are 14 versions to do this checked into TickleLib. 13 and a half of them were done by an undergrad who never finished. Um, our extensibility, that was critical. You know, that's, that's where all of the other people who tried to do this project fell on their faces. Um, back at the Boston conference in 96, 96 or 97, uh, Kernighan gave, gave a talk on developing the same piece of, of application in Visual Basic, Tickle, and Java. And he said he, the fastest thing to get running was Visual Basic, and then he hit the ceiling. He couldn't develop it. It couldn't, it couldn't be done. Um, yeah. We don't have a ceiling. That's pretty nice. Um, and yeah, the, the introspection that we've got, that's another thing that where Tickle is unique. And that really saves on the debugging time, because you, you open up a TKCon, thank you, Jeff. I have lived in TKCon. Um, but I'm just running a PTO. You know, I get something mostly running, it fails. Now I open up TKCon and attach, and I've got a full look into it to look at all of my variables, all of my states. And that just makes the debugging so much nicer. Okay. Okay. Um, questions, answers, bubbles, and bubbles. How has the acceptance been in the marketplace? <clears throat> well, as I, it's a very good question. How's the acceptance been in the marketplace? Um, we're starting to break the ice. Imagine if somebody came to you tomorrow and said, we want you to do something that's totally 180 degrees opposite from